name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So last week we did a sound check from over here. I'm going to do a sound check from here today. So if anybody's having difficulty hear me, hear me, hearing me, let me know. Just raise your hand. Okay, I'll try and talk louder. The holidays are a time when family and friends will gather together for fellowship and fun, rest and relaxation. Many will travel from far away, another state, across the country, even from a foreign country to be near the people they love. These gatherings will be celebrated with big meals, the retelling of old stories, entertainment, and recreational activities, and catching up on the latest in each other's life. In the process, new memories will be made. When we say holiday season, we are usually referring to Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. Most of us probably know that the term holiday is rooted in the Old English Halikdag, meaning holy day. So holidays were originally religious festivals, usually preceded by fasting periods. Holidays were days of joy and celebration and feasting. Now, today's gospel reading that we just heard from Father Theodore, or Deacon Theodore, and by the way, welcome to Deacon Perry Palmalis, who's with us today. In this gospel reading, we heard about a feast. It is no accident that this passage is read every year on the second Sunday before the feast of the Nativity of our Lord. It is in this passage, we hear Jesus tell the parable of the great banquet in which it says someone gave a great dinner, mega dipnon, or dipnon mega, and invited many. The allusion is to the great heavenly banquet. This allusion is obvious in that the, in the verse immediately preceding today's reading, the verse we didn't hear, the person says to Jesus, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now one could interpret the original invitees to be God's chosen people, the Jews or the Israelites. As we know, the invitees made all sorts of excuses as to why they could not come. But the host would not let any seat at the banquet be empty, and he sent his slave servant out to bring people in, as it says in verse 21, and compel them to enter in verse 23. Some interpretations assert that the host is God the Father, and his slave or servant is Jesus Christ. The alternate invitees, in other words, the secondary invitees, are the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the pagans. Now today, I would like us to focus on the alternative invitees. They were specified in the gospel to be the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And we know that Jesus' earthly ministry was directed towards these various groups of people. He speaks of himself when he directs the disciples and saying, go and tell John, this is from Matthew 11, he says, go and tell John meaning John the Baptist, the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have a gospel preached to them. This parable of the banquet is not just alluding to a future kingdom in heaven, but it refers to an earthly reality that can be realized here and now, each and every Sunday since the day of Pentecost in the year 33 AD, the church holds a great dinner, Vipnon Mega, which is the mystical supper. 
the main course is the Eucharist, Holy Communion. And we, you and me, the faithful, are invited to partake. We are also called to become voluntary slaves of God who go out and invite others to come. So let us ask ourselves, do we invite to the great banquet of the divine liturgy those whom we know, like friends, neighbors, relatives, parishioners? And if we don't, why not? Are we afraid or embarrassed of what people might think when we say to them, come, for all is now made ready? And if we are not comfortable inviting the people we do know, how can we invite those we probably do not know? Like the blind, the lame, the deaf, and the poor. The divine liturgy is a model and a paradigm for our whole life. So the great banquet extends into every part of our life. What do I mean? Well, here I think everyone can relate. Who is having guests over for dinner on or around the holidays? You don't have to raise your hand. Probably most of us are, and if not, we are likely the ones who are traveling near or far to be at someone else's home who is hosting a holiday gathering. If we are hosting, however, likely we have invited family and close friends. Perhaps we've invited work associates or new acquaintances, new acquaintances that we'd like to get to know better. We may have invited some nice people who had no other place to go for the holidays. And this is all great, and this is all wonderful. Sharing a meal in fellowship is one of the most enjoyable and healing activities that humans engage in. But wait a minute. Consider the words that Jesus Christ spoke right before the parable of the banquet. In other words, we didn't hear it in today's gospel, but it came right before the passage. Where it says, and this is Jesus speaking to a, a person who invited him into his home or into his domain. He said to him, he goes, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, how many of our invite lists for the holiday dinners include the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame? My guess is very few, if any. Now, I'm sure most of us don't invite our family, friends, and neighbors in order to be repaid. Maybe somebody, some, someone. We do it out of the goodness of our heart. Yet, why don't we invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind people? Is it because perhaps we consider their suffering a burden to us? Or perhaps we don't want to be reminded of possible misfortunes that could strike us, as if somehow keeping a safe distance from them will protect us. Perhaps others would say, well, you know, I don't really know any poor people. I don't know anyone who's maimed, lame, or blind. And this may be true, but at the same time, it also shows that there's something lacking in our life if we don't know these kind of people. Remember, in the parable, the host, the owner of the house, told his slaves to go out immediately and find these disadvantaged, marginalized people. The message is to reach out with urgency beyond your usual cadre of 
acquaintances. This was not merely a looking out at one, outside one's front door, but also exiting from your home, then venturing out into the streets, rimas in Greek, as it says in the gospel, and public squares, plateas. Everybody knows that's that term. And since the owner's table or house was not yet full after doing this, he commands the slaves to travel even further, exploring the highways, odus, and byways, pragmus, which means secluded, obscure roads. In other words, not well-traveled places. And Jesus' words also state quite directly and simply that these suffering souls are not merely to be invited but rather to be brought in. Everybody knows about Greek insistency, right? Brought in and compelled to come in. And we Greeks identify with taking somebody by the arm and literally bringing them into our home or compelling them to come in. We don't take no for an answer easily. Now, why is it so important for us to invite, to even compel and bring in these unfortunate persons? Well, of course, Christ said, if we do this, we will be blessed and repaid at the resurrection. However, even more central to the question is that by sharing our dinner or supper with the poor, maimed, lame, and blind, we are sharing ourselves with Christ himself. We are bringing him into our hearts, compelling him to have mercy on us as we deliver our goods to the least of these, his brethren. Now, in conclusion, sharing a meal in fellowship we know is a close personal encounter entering more deeply into relationship with the other. As we relate to the least of Christ's people, we relate to him. If we accept the invitation to Christ's Eucharistic banquet any and every Sunday, in which the divine liturgy is celebrated, then we are likewise accepting the call to become slaves of God the Father. And that means to do God's bidding, to announce the good news of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And if we are to become like Christ, then we must share the table of our house with the sinners and poor of spirit giving them not only material food, but more importantly, the spiritual food of hope, love, and faith. Now, certainly we have every right and freedom to refuse Christ's invitation and calling, but to do so places our very life in peril. For Christ himself said, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner referring to the original invitees who made excuses for not attending the great banquet. My brothers and sisters, the Eucharist of the liturgy and the table of fellowship with the poor are our preparation for the heavenly banquet at the resurrection, the second coming of Christ. The apostle and evangelist John wrote about this in the book of Revelation. And it's, he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. This is Revelation 19, 9. We are invited to the Lord's heavenly banquet to the divine liturgy of the Eucharist, but who will be on our holiday invite list? Amen.